Hello and welcome back to Sinews of War. In the previous episode, Nassau had to face an attack by the Spanish at Georgia, bringing a massive army filled with Native American troops. Luckily, the battle was easy enough. He had defenders' advantage, and the enemy didn't have the morale to break his lines, his cavalry, doing a lot of work against the enemy, but also inflicting a lot of friendly fire. We then met a new general, Ostra, who went to defeat the remainder of the Spanish in Florida. Again, that battle was relatively easy, with him just pressing the advantage against the scattered Spanish army, which had split its force in two, much to its detriment. He then went on to basically clear up all of our American territories, taking out all the Spanish raiders and suddenly putting us in a very secure position, allowing Nassau to go and attack the Spanish strongholds. Meanwhile, in Spain itself, there was a surprise attack when forces from Italy suddenly marched all the way to Madrid and we were forced to fight a defensive battle. The enemy had morale trouble, but has just about managed to scale the walls with their swordsmen and now our militia must fight in a deadly melee. Let's continue. Adam, I've been waiting. Please have a seat. Not General Ustra anymore. Not to me. Make others call you whatever you want. Now sit. We never really went over the company policy before you started, so there are various things you need to review. I wouldn't be too worried. General van der Sau has let me in on the whole arrangement. Ah, but you assume General van der Sau isn't set up to be court-martialed the moment his commission ends. His example isn't exactly one to be looking up to. Be serious. I've served under him for years, and I never sensed anything amiss. Well, the fact you didn't notice the problem at all, even more justifies me calling you here to point it out. For to the trained eye, it is obvious. I feel rather caught off guard. Okay then, please explain, sir. I listen eagerly. Good. You see, Nassau operates on a very personal set of principles, doing what he thinks is right and not what the company thinks is right. He wishes, most worryingly, to engage the primitives quite fully into company operations, the same folly that brought Spain to its knees before us. So know this, my young fellow. The policy of the West India Company is that the produce of this land belongs first and foremost to the company, and that is just as true of its human crop as it is of its cotton. That's a rather harsh way of putting it, isn't it? The world is harsh, and international military operations are harsher. A soldier like you can appreciate that, I'm sure. Something that a leader must learn to respect is the reality of the world and the hierarchy of peoples within it. Ten slaves sweep the floors outside, but only we enjoy the comforts of the fire, you see? I suppose I see it. I'm not sure... It isn't the easiest thing to digest for a man without pedigree, I know. But I suppose the best advice I can give you will be to... Ask a company representative for help before you go counselling with Nassau. For the good of your career, I suggest you distance yourself from him as much as you can. So the Spanish soldiers, or I guess I should say African soldiers, are continuing their attack here on the fort at Madrid, where our line infantry are now going to have to fight in Malay. You can see I've bolstered all the militia with the actual garrison line infantry in order to make sure we don't lose this fight, because I wasn't confident the militia could hold off that unit on their own, so the higher stats of the line infantry should help out. The main problem, though, is that having these guys not fire at people means more might come up the ropes, not scared away by the morale shock. On other parts of the fort, you can see the enemy are still in disarray because we still have our firing lines set up. So really, it's just this one face where there is a risk factor. And the enemy's numbers, though, starting to drop quite rapidly, as you can see. So it's not going to be a huge issue, I don't think. I think we are going to be able to beat that unit off. And now I'm actually pulling units out of the melee to start setting up to fire at other ones to stop them from coming in. There's a unit right here, which appears to be thinking about coming up the ropes to join us. Another one comes around the corner, takes a hefty volley from the line once they finish setting up, so that's going to start to push their numbers. The cannon fire doing so as well, so that's nice. Doesn't have the big morale shock I thought it would, though, so they're going to continue their attack running right at those ropes. The unit next door 
Uh, now going to be liable to taking fire from the militia who've actually finished off that first unit. The first one was uh, quite weak, there's only a couple of hundred men in it. So they need to actually sort themselves out because there's actually two units standing on top of each other weirdly there. So as they go to cover more of the wall, this other unit almost makes the climb but actually routes just as the first members hit the ropes. So that is fantastic. They are going to run off and those guys who come up the wall are probably going to be doomed. Now, a tiny bit later, the other unit that was waiting around did actually make the climb after quite a long wait for an unexplained reason. So once again, it's a deadly melee at the top. And although the enemy have the advantage, we just have so many numbers and they've lost so many of their troops to routing that at this stage, I don't think it's actually possible to lose. We can just grind through our garrison against the enemy and we'll be able to take them out. The enemy's morale going to be low as well, so we don't have to kill them all. So promptly, we defeated that unit, but the enemy still had militia outside who were just firing on the walls not really hitting anything so I sent my troops outside to go and shoot at them and curiously they decided to use the enemy's ropes rather than going down the ramps and out the gates I guess that's the fastest way so good for them now, while I was setting up and not really paying attention, the enemy's general suddenly attacked. I'd actually forgotten about their general. He was just sitting at the back of the map the whole time. But now he makes this attack, so I'm going to get my troops into melee to try and surround and attack this guy. So hopefully we can take him out. He will do some damage with the initial charge, but now he's sort of spread himself out and his unit's really surrounded by our men. So we can attack from all sides with light infantry and militia who are just going to swamp him, as you can see. Not going to be good for that general. It's quite handy because I thought we might end up not killing them that general because we would go and kill those militia and then the general would rout so we're going to kill the general a much higher value unit of course so that's handy more men coming down from the walls to join the fight so I thought I'd try and find the general himself in here you can see he's got this uh, white periwig thing going on so you can see he's also very surrounded <laughs> he's in big trouble his horse is killed very rapidly he is killed after that so the enemy general dead their morale doesn't seem to break right away so we're gonna have to fight through the rest of those horsemen and the militia also didn't break which I thought might happen so that meant I was going to have to finish these guys off and form up again ready to advance on the militia but about halfway through forming up the militia just randomly routed I think they might have got tired or something and that lowered their morale and just pushed them over the edge so that's good news a heroic victory at madrid the very sneaky surprise attack from the spanish has been pushed away thanks to the fact we left so many militia behind when we moved out our main force so the survivors of the spanish army will rush back to the ports and we'll have to try and catch up with them later <laughs> it's as i expected you see every power that picks a fight with the dutch gets their american colonies taken away and their homelands occupied with incredible speed impressive indeed but i am far from intimidated by it in fact seeing their power in action gives me hope for that other issue we all discussed at the last meeting the ottoman menace now report has it the ottomans and the dutch have some kind of strange friendliness going on in that the dutch seem to have the same contempt for the civilized powers that the turks do but if they could be turned on each other well the two greatest threats to the world's freedom could be made to waste their strength in a stalemate while enterprising nations like ours regained ground At the start of the next turn, we have some more good technology news. The socket bayonet is complete, increasing our melee stats by some unspecified amount, and perhaps more importantly, unlocking the military academy to be built, which is going to give us some nice higher tier units available, including some of the better line infantry. So that's very nice. We're going to start building that right away in Amsterdam. So in the future, we should see some special units coming out of there. So there's the survivors of the Spanish army hanging around in that port. Right now, we're not actually going to do anything about them. I'm going to assume that I'm going to take them out without my main force because the main force is going to be busy. So I am going to recruit some more units here in Madrid. So we might be able to put something together to go out and stop them. But really, we're going to focus on this, the Spanish main force in Gibraltar. Vos is able to go up and just start besieging the place. It's not a very important uh, region at all, worth virtually nothing. So we're really just here to kill that army to get rid of it. Meanwhile, in America, Ustra, now freed up from fighting the Spanish further down south, can move up to chase after Nassau, who, as you can see, is currently on the offensive against the Spanish Native American holdings. We've got some of them under siege, and there's another half stack nearby to worry about. I was considering also, back in Europe, splitting the fleet that I have blockading the Spanish ports to blockade both of those ports with uh, Spanish fleets in them so they can't do any more funny business, but I decided not to risk it. I don't think they can 
do anything too damaging right now. And as you can see, that army that previously failed to attack Madrid actually comes back for another go just with fewer troops. I decided I'll just auto resolve this. Laying down a cheeky quick save just before because I don't trust the auto resolve to <laughs> do something sensible, but actually it was fine. So more survivors fall back to the port yet again. Now in America, we see this sally from the Spanish with four units against my whole army. The balance bar is even, apparently. I don't trust it for a second, so I'm going to make another cheeky quick save and just auto resolve to see if it was lying. And it was. So that was fantastic. The result's absolutely fine, as you'd expect. And we'll actually capture that settlement as a result of that win. We also learn that Austria has been destroyed. I didn't see this coming because I haven't really been paying attention to what's happening in Eastern Europe. But as you can see, the Ottoman Empire has conquered its way up and taken Austrian territories. And the Polish as well have got a pretty big holding in the area. The Prussians hanging on in amongst the gaps along with some of the other German states. So an interesting situation. We're not hostile with any of these guys, so we are just ignoring it for that reason. But we might have to deal with that soon. Now, I decided that I was going to put a force together here in Genoa to go and take out other Spanish holdings in Europe, such as Corsica and Italy. So we've got Voss's old army here, and I'm going to supplement it with some additional forces that I can just recruit from the locals, because we happen to have decent buildings around here. We can even recruit these Valdeck Infantry, a superior version of line infantry. We're limited to how many we're allowed to actually use in the campaign, but we'll throw some into this army to make it more powerful. Ustra is now able to move up to support Nassau, who, as you can see, is now occupying that settlement he had under siege. So now we had these two stacks against the remaining Spanish army. Things are definitely going to go our way. We're going to slightly invest in the infrastructure of these places, which the Spanish apparently didn't bother to do, and advance on that settlement. And it's just a small, mostly native army inside. Balance bar really far in our favor. One more cheeky quick save and auto resolve trick. And yes, it works out absolutely fine. So we take the place. The public order situation is actually pretty bad, though. You can see the place we just left is really, really angry. These Cherokee lands. So we're going to need to actually bring the army back in to go and reoccupy the Cherokee lands, which means we are going to be left with pretty much nothing in the new territory. But actually, that's fine because they're OK. I think the Cherokee lands, because they're the capital of the Cherokee, which is one of the factions, that means they're just very angry. So they're going to be harder to uh, occupy. Now, jumping all the way over to India, I finally prepared this fleet that's been coming for a long time under Duven, a big war fleet full of big ships and lots of small minor ships to use to take trade nodes. And we are going back to the East Indies once again to see what we can do. We need to take on the Spanish main fleet there and start occupying nodes. I also noticed that this nearby Indian settlement was really, really valuable, so that was interesting to see. It's also starting to become Protestant, which is quite handy, thanks to the efforts of our minister. So it seems there's some serious money available if we were to make an attack on India, but we're far away from that right now. So next up, it's the Spanish at Gibraltar sallying out against Voss. They finally did something after spending the whole campaign just sitting in this settlement. We've tempted them to make a move, so they're going to attack out. They have a slight advantage on the balance bar. Their infantry is probably technically better than mine, but because we have generals in our army that's buffing our stats slightly, especially morale, that means things aren't so uneven, so that's really going to help out. So down here on the battlefield, here's the Spanish army advancing in a very messy and loose formation. They deployed very weirdly and just started immediately advancing. And that's probably because this battlefield is crazy. This is actually a great battlefield. The whole middle of the field is just a set of cliffs, and we're on the top of those cliffs. That means the enemy can't advance straight down the middle to get to us. They're going to have to take roundabout routes, and that's why I've got these defensive lines set up on both of my flanks where the main bodies of infantry are stationed. The enemy actually deployed a couple of units on top of the cliffs here on our left side, these Irish brigades, and they're going to come right at us while the rest of their army is going to take the slower route far away. They need to come up around the edge of these cliffs here and they can go through these woods to reach our other defensive position. So that's both going to delay their advance and split it, making it easy for us to defeat them. They were really lucky actually with their artillery who were just sneaking shots over the lip of those cliffs and getting some hits in amongst these reserves who were just standing in no particular formations. I assumed they were safe, so that was interesting. We're going to have to start moving out and take up a uh, less vulnerable formation because of that. 
So the Irish Brigade get close to my line here, and now we're going to see that fire by rank technology that we unlocked in action as three ranks and these volleys on the enemy. So we've tripled our firepower here. Absolutely fantastic. And when combined with the trenches, that means these line infantry units are going to be very strong against these Irish Brigades who are just out in the open. They don't have fire by rank. They don't even have uh, ring bay in there, as you can see. So they're going to fire back at us, and that's going to be a really ineffective way to fight with us. They would be much better off just charging into melee because they have such a disadvantage at range. So once again, we're just going to be blocking all their shots and hitting them with volley after volley, firing really rapidly thanks to fire by rank. The only real risk to this strategy is running out of ammunition, but at least we're going to be hitting the enemy with that ammunition, so that's fine. Meanwhile, on the other side, these men aren't firing by rank. It seems like all of our men actually really got into their heads how to do the fire by rank, so some of them just firing with the first rank, very inefficient. They're actually under, at under attack sorry, by gun cav. Their scout cavalry just ran in and jumped over the trenches, as you can see, and started slashing into our men. So that was an interesting decision, probably the better decision because again they would have struggled to fight at range with those gun cav. But we have so many men around here and many of them are going to be firing at point blank range into the boxed down enemy cavalry. I think they're really going to struggle, they should not have attacked without their infantry having uh, come to weaken us up first. And my melee cav are just going to dive into this to take out all of those scouts with relative ease. So this front is now going to be secure, ready for their next wave. Look at that. Voss's regiments didn't learn the drills. Oh, serves him right for never even consulting his officers. They probably never even got to see the manuals. It's brute force with him all the way. He'd probably be better off arming his men with sticks and clubs. But I can't get too smug, because you'll notice that after all this, he'll act like nothing is wrong, and that there was no way to avoid all the loss of life among his own men. He's an emotionless husk with a thirst for blood, a master first and a leader second. Not sure if we have any chance of changing him, and frankly, I think it would be best if we just tried to keep our distance. Oh, look at that mess he's made, charging through his own lines. Shall we show him how to use horsemen sensibly? Back on the left, in order to speed up the defeat of those Irish regiments, I deployed a whole wing of cav down from this hill adjacent to their formation. So we're now going to make a very nice flank attack that is going to spell doom for the Irish regiment there as they're surrounded, they're already weakened from fire, their bodies all over the floor. The adjacent regiment is going to get involved as well, so we are going to have to fight two regiments at once with our three of horse, but that's not really going to be a problem, and we can make the situation even better by having all those infantry who now shouldn't really be firing on the melee just charge across the field to join it, but I think we actually defeated the Irish before they arrived. Back on the other wing, things are pretty much fine. The only thing that's out of place with the now orderly formation are the flying horse corpses. I'm not 100% sure how the Spanish have managed this, but our men don't seem to be too put off by it, so we'll just let that slide. So the Irish try to make their escape as they are rapidly defeated by the cav, and as you follow the route, you can actually see our cavalrymen seem fairly reluctant to actually kill the enemy. They're mainly just trotting around them and hiding them from view, not actually attacking them there, so I don't know if they uh, felt some affinity or they felt pity on the Irish, but they're going to let them escape. Not that that's really much consolation, considering the fact they already killed 90 plus percent of them. But anyway, I realised there were some more of the Irish regiments back here. I think they might have been intended to join the attack initially, but got stuck on the terrain or something. So we may be able to go and hunt those guys down if they are just going to stand there. Meanwhile, back on the other front, the enemy have done the same thing they did to start the battle. They've sent in the scouts into melee. But this time, these scouts don't hang around too long to see what happens. They rout and escape with most of their numbers but intact our men going to chase them off with a little fire and then start reforming on the trenches. The real threat for them is going to be the enemy's main force, which is slowly hiking its way up the hill over here, but with so many of their line infantry units already defeated or distracted, they're not going to have all that many to make this attack. For some reason, they've got far ahead of their forces. The Spanish bandits, a very weak-looking unit, they've got uh, no protection really and just swords to fight with. So not the sort of unit you want just standing in front of the firing line, but that's what they're doing because, well, 
I guess we'll never know why they chose to do that. Perhaps they didn't like them. They want to get their bandits killed off in battle. Meanwhile, the Irish in the corner of the map are now in trouble once again as my cavalry find them and take out the final regiment there, not fighting for very long before routing with our cavalry only taking minor losses. So that's fantastic. A lot of the enemy's infantry now defeated even before the main part of the fight's really begun. They are starting to arrive here near our trench line. And our men are still not really able to get that fire by rank going. They're still just firing oddly. I think having their formation disrupted by being melee attacked earlier on means they're not in whatever perfect lines you need for the fire by rank to work, so they just don't do it. The bandits still somehow getting away with just walking up and down in front of the line very casually, gradually getting shot. I guess not firing by rank means it's quite slow to cut them down. There we see one unit actually does use fire by rank right at the last second, pretty much when it's too late, because the enemy are actually coming for a melee attack with the majority of their army, and that's probably a good shout, but you can see they're actually doing it at a walking pace, which is not a good shout. Out, so they're going to take abnormally high losses on this advance, perhaps hoping to intimidate us with their confidence, but uh, on a more practical basis, a very bad idea. So finally, when they get really close, they do actually just charge. They're going to dive over these trenches and start fighting in an open melee with our troops. So at this stage, we don't really have an advantage anymore. In a straight melee, it's uh, really just going to be every man for himself, the enemy probably having a disadvantage manpower wise because their force is split but then again ours are split as well we do have the bayonets of course which will help out but it's not going to stop this fight from being really bloody for both sides so you can see it's just a chaotic melee the formation is actually holding on fairly well it's not too open of a fight and over here the trenches seem to provide us with some advantage still because our men can get up and stab down at the enemy i don't know if this counts as high ground in the game's logic but it very well might because our men seem to be doing quite well having that height advantage over the enemy so that is all good stuff we're gonna have to just hold on in that melee and hope that we win out at least on the morale side of things meanwhile there were some more irish which were uh, sneaking around perhaps going for a rear flank attack i don't know on the other side of the battlefield not coming up with the rest of their line but a cavalry unit found them and they were quickly dispatched as well i hear you a friend of england's an enemy of mine but this is shite of the highest order these Spaniards can't tie their boots without losing a finger or two. Why are we listening to them? The pay's as light as a feather and the whole place is a windy day short of being a desert. And you've seen what these Dutchmen are like. They aren't messing around here. They've got the shiniest gear in Europe. Half the boys are beat up already and the other half will be next if we keep up this charade that El Generalissimo over there knows what's happening. I think it's fair to say we've had our quarrel here already. Time to start sorting out a way to get out. The Dutch got no bother with us. They'll let us go fine. This isn't our fight anymore. Back on the melee front, the enemy are starting to retreat, which is fantastic news because they're actually breaking through here on our left. That unit falling back and exposing the flanks of the men behind the trenches. So the enemy now starting to sneak around right there. But with many of their comrades having fled this battle, we're going to have an advantage that means the melee probably is going to go our way. Plus, we are bringing in a second line of men. The line from the other side of the army is no longer needed. So they are just strolling up in good order to form a second line behind the battle. But even before they arrive, you can see things are starting to clear up as the enemy are falling back. More of them now combating us at range, but that's fine by us. We can now reform with the melee over and go into a ranged combat where, of course, we're still going to have that advantage thanks to the trenches. Still not getting that fire by rank action, unfortunately so we're not getting the uh, maximal advantage we really should be getting but it's going to be enough to take out those units standing in front of us now I ordered all of those cav at the back of the map to actually go down the cliffs and try and hunt the enemy's artillery and such who are still hanging around down here. Unfortunately for me it didn't work out like that and I didn't notice until just about now in the battle. Two of the units actually went the opposite direction and came all the way around to go down the cliffs via the routes the enemy came up. As a result they clashed with the enemy in these forests in front of the firing line but actually that wasn't an enormous problem because of course they actually can beat those enemies so this is speeding up the destruction 
of those enemy units. Here you can see more gorillas being discovered. They can hide most of the time, those gorillas. So you just come across them with calf. Luckily, easy to kill once you do. And here you can see I'm pulling the calf back out. They've done the damage. They basically rushed in, did huge damage to the enemy, and routed some of their calf. And now they're down to just a few regiments. And these mounted bandits, their general's unit, is watching on. So I'm pulling the calf back so we can go back to a line battling situation. Most of the enemy's remaining infantry are line infantry. So we really want them to go back into firing at the trenches so they don't really do any damage to us and we'll gradually take them down. As for the unit that actually did do what I thought they were going to do and go around the back of the map to hit the enemy's position down here, they're finding some success. More hidden gorillas appearing in front of them, so they're going to take those guys down. They didn't actually manage to get the enemy's artillery because of that, but still doing damage to the enemy. On top of the hill, the firing is going to continue once again as the enemy, thankfully, set up to battle with these men, so that is going to be great. This officer, a little bit too enthusiastic, standing over the trenches, possibly anticipating a melee charge by the looks of it, but the enemy are willing to fight at range. Unfortunately for me, these cav down here actually got attacked by the enemy's cav, so their unit was the same as mine, Regiment of Horse, but it had a, a few more men in it, and because it's on very hard difficulty, the enemy gets a stat boost, which means combats between equal units will always go in the enemy's favour, so unfortunately that unit of cav is going to be lost without the support of the other two units that were meant to join it. At least things are going well up here. You can see the enemy firing on these parts of the line where we have two units firing back, only one in trenches, so it's probably the weakest part of the line, so they are engaging correctly, but not going to make a big difference. I thought I'd see what our men could actually see of the enemy, and as we saw there, they can barely see the targets they're trying to hit. But look how fast this volley fire is, especially with two units adjacent to each other, just blasting one after the other. So we're getting rapid fire volleys on the enemy. It's not doing all that much damage because, as I said, they can't can't really get line of sight on what they're firing at the enemy now just standing here not even firing back just taking the fire but it is going to be inflicting morale shocks even if we aren't killing them further down the line the enemy looking like they're going to go for a morale attack here but their men are already wavering before they arrive at the line they're just being gunned down on the approach and they are not actually going to have the guts to jump over the trench and go into it so they fall back and as they fall back they're going to take yet more gunfire so a deadly situation for those men they attacked again, uh, slightly further down the line, again finding a spot where we didn't have the trenches to fight, so that's a good decision from the enemy, but it's not enough. The fire by rank gives us such an advantage at range that uh, the enemy is just being scared off, especially with their army losses now starting to mount up. Their morale is low. Further down the hill, the uh, enemy's cavalry, who had defeated my cav, had come all the way around and looked like they were going for a cheeky rear attack, but all of my own remaining cav were able to catch them, so we will be able to win that engagement and finally destroy the enemy's cavalry advantage. But for these guys, these mounted bandits, were firing at us with these very weak-sounding pistols, not really doing any damage. Uh, luckily, because I had my cavalry right next door, having just defeated the enemy's cav, they could just come in and engage the bandits in melee, so that's fantastic. We're finally going to get a chance to go after their general. I didn't know how good these bandits were in melee, but I just assumed they were worse than uh, my professionally trained cavalrymen. And we're also going to be able to bring in this unit of line infantry to fight in the melee. They actually charge in the wrong direction at first, then wheeling about as they get closer to get a really nice flank attack on those bandits. So that's going to help out a lot. The enemy's general could be an enormous difficulty if he wants to get out of this one. The cavalry could easily chase him down. So this is our chance to kill him. And the line infantry with their bayonets are going to do the business. There goes the general. So that's going to further sap enemy morale. They really don't have anything left at this point anyway. I finally got cavalry down to go and take out those artillery who were just wandering about down here. I think they were actually trying to bring them up the cliffs. Because I saw some of them starting to go up the hill. But obviously not a good idea. They are killed quite rapidly. And the last units of enemy infantry are going to be so Subject to a little uh, killing contest, Gaiden and Voss charge down the hill, really the only units who weren't exhausted at this point, so I thought we'll just charge them out to do damage to the enemy, and they're slashing through this enemy regiment which has been split into two sections, they go right down the middle, so now the enemy have uh, our generals kind of surrounded because of that attack, but they are not going to continue the fight, of course they've already lost this battle and they realise it, so they're going to be cut down as they try to escape. And that's going to bring the battle to an end. A huge mess up here on the trenches. Lots of friendly bodies, but lots of enemy ones as well. In the end, a victory. The enemy losing thousands of men, us losing just under 1,000. So a pretty good result. Many of the kills being on the cavalry, of course, thanks to those early raids at the start of the battle, killing tons of enemy infantry. Some of the line infantry putting in a strong performance as well. So this victory means that the final field army of the Kingdom of Spain has been destroyed.
In the hills of Gibraltar, the Dutch perfected a new and deadly tactic. The volley fire drill, allowing several ranks to shoot past each other safely, rapidly increased the deadliness of line battle engagements. And that increase in deadliness fell squarely on the unprepared Spanish, who were shocked at the horrendous casualties inflicted by the rapid, if inaccurate, fire. With such mastery of the battlefield, a new era in the already hugely successful military campaigns of the United Provinces was about to arrive. And for Western Europe, this could prove to be a saving place, for the unchecked power of the Ottoman Empire was creeping over the world in tandem with the Dutch. There was a strong probability that the two massive powers would clash. Thanks for watching. We'll try to wrap things up with the Spanish, but face a deadly setback in the next episode of Sinews of War.